it's my job in the morning to uh, get the kids dressed and get them to uh, daycare. And one morning, uh, I was getting my daughter dressed and I couldn't find her shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Just couldn't find them. I was gonna be late for work. At that time, I was driving three or four people with me to work, including this one woman who was having a lot of trouble getting to work on time and who the company had said the next time she's late, she's going to get fired. So I'm running around the house, <clears throat> screaming at my daughter, trying to find her shoes. Shoe crises in Gloucester, New Jersey. Hello, I'm Laverne Hancock, and this is Child Care Update USA. When Mark Dutzik faces a crisis, he knows how to think on his feet. Finally, I got an old pair of her shoes that were too small for, for her. I stuffed her feet in and <laughs> ran her to the center and drove 70 miles an hour into work. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell is going on here? This is something that uh, the union should be doing something about. I just screamed at my daughter, put an incredible stress on her. It was like my daughter was punching a time clock at the age of three years old. Good to think there are child labor laws. In this special report, we will look at the American worker and the rapidly changing American family. The two-parent Ozzy and Harriet family of the 50s, where dad is the sole financial support, now represents less than 10% of the population. 10%? She can't be serious. Most American women are working out of economic necessity. Today, 70% hold jobs because they are single, divorced, widowed, or married to husbands earning less than $14,000. Honey, she knows what she's talking about. 63% uh -huh. of mothers with children under 18 are employed. In fact, nearly 50% of all working moms are back on the job before their child's first birthday. We sure couldn't afford to have you stay home for a whole year. With all these changes, working parents are asking, who will care for our children? Oh, boy, I hope it's Grandma. No, honey, Grandma can't. She's working. New problems demand new solutions, and the American labor movement is finding them. The first steps toward a solution often cost the employers little or nothing. This commercial publicizes a low-cost information and referral service won by the United Auto Workers in bargaining with the big three automakers. The United Steelworkers negotiated joint labor management child care committees with three major steelmakers. And in bargaining with Michigan Bell, communication workers won funding for a catalog on available child care resources. Now we go back to Cluster, New Jersey, where chemical workers and their spouses are struggling with their employers, major pharmaceutical companies, for solutions to childcare problems. My wife had to start work at 4.30, so if there was any driving time, I was having to leave work at 3.30, so I would get home in time for my wife to get to work. Like, driving like a maniac, and then it's like, hi, goodbye, and then she'd leave and we'd have to go to go to bed before she comes home because she's getting in at 1 o'clock in the morning. It's hard on us because we don't get to see each other. It's like we're not even married. I mean, it's like we're living single. Married we're like... On the week. Yeah. <laughs> that's the biggest change that's taken place in the last uh, 15 years in the workplace is that uh, most workers just cannot support a family on one paycheck. And where years ago, even if I was working and my mother could help out with taking care of my young kids. Today, the grandmothers are working too. No, Nobody's at home anymore. Yeah, you definitely need two people working. All you have to do is look at the uh, statistics. People's yeah. standard of living since 1973 yeah. has consistently gone down. You look at what's going on in the world, 50% of the new jobs created in the last 10 years pay uh, below the poverty level. There's no way in hell that you can raise a family on these, yeah. these type of uh, incomes. So they're going to turn the kids back in? Can they get a refund? <laughs> Luckily, Don, they're a little more creative than that. These are union people who saw the need for a union committee on work and family. The process began when the members started talking to each other about their problems. And I guess that's what really got everything started because we realized there were a lot of people at work that were having almost the same problems. The main things that people felt a committee would be useful for were uh, negotiating with the company about policies that would improve family life, create less stress on families, to also have the committee 
help people find resources in the community like child care. We started doing research, finding um, community services of all kinds. We have a whole booklet that we set up. And it worked out really well because then when we were ready to sit down with the company, we said, look, this is what we've done. We've produced this booklet. We've, uh, our people are experts in referral. And, you know, the company couldn't say, well, this is a bad thing. This is a threatening thing. They had to encourage that activity. And then we, can, we have a basis to ask for more flexibility on their part when there really isn't a so solution available in the community. Unions have, have to take these issues up for the future of the labor movement. We've got to be in touch with the problems that our members face. 50 years ago, we took up the fight for pensions. That's because uh, people, society had changed, families didn't stay together the way that they used to, that people needed lifetime security. Now society has changed again. People have to work, families have to work, and we have to take up that fight for the interests of those workers. You said it, Mark. Just look at the example of parental leave. In the U.S., only 40% of working women have gained maternity leave. Most often, it's short-term and unpaid. Worldwide, however, the current count of countries legally guaranteeing parental leave with job security and full or partial pay has risen to 117. Unfortunately, the U.S. is not among them. But now in Congress, there is the beginning of change. The Family and Medical Leave Act would assure working parents unpaid time off with job security to care for a new baby or sick family member. Unions are rallying around this cause on the national level, just as AFSCME members did on a state level in Illinois, where they passed the Family Responsibility Leave Act covering their state workers. Having won this legislative battle, AFSCME was then able to incorporate parental leave language into their statewide contract. For more on this, we go to Alton, Illinois, where Carol Lovelace was one of the first to benefit from the new contract. We knew when uh, we planned for Anne that we wanted to devote all that we could to her early formative time. I knew that I wanted to stay home with her as long as possible, and Dean was very supportive of that, too. Most of the women that I know in my workplace, when they have a baby, they're back to work within six or eight weeks. They're emotionally upset about having to leave an infant. The, there's no semblance of a routine for an infant at that age. Uh, there's no sleep pattern that's really predictable, no eating pattern that's really predictable. And you see women coming to work that are totally exhausted and, and uh, they don't want to be there. I was fortunate where I work. I'm a member of the AFSCME and looked at my contract book and realized that I had the uh, availability of a family responsibility leave to me, which was for a period of one year. With an arrangement like this, uh, both of us are rested. Um, uh, tempers aren't worn thin. It's made it so much easier for us to uh, care for Annie and take care of ourselves too. When I applied for my leave, there had never been a family leave applied for before. The facility didn't quite know how to handle it, so they decided that in addition to the papers that I prepared, I would provide two documents to support why it was important for a mother to stay home with her baby. It just knocked me to the floor because I thought one generation ago, you know, 20 years ago, it would have been the other way around. You would have needed documents to support why you wanted to be out of the home when you had a baby at home. Grandpa talking? No, I like my career. I've devoted a lot of time and energy to it for 15 years. I was ready to go back at, at uh, the one-year period. This has been the most important benefit that I have derived from the contract that I have with my union. If I could advise someone who would think about taking a family leave, um, I would say plan ahead for it because during the time that you're off, um, you'll be unpaid. That's what we did. We, we put aside, we budgeted, we planned for the time when our, our income would be cut considerably. So go for it. Don't look back. Do it. Well, Laverne Hancock didn't look back. She had to go call the child care center. It seems her daughter, Carmen, swallowed a spoon. I'm Don Murphy. In our top story, child care problems are shown to affect parents' performance on the job. A recent study revealed that child care problems create as much stress as overtime, relationships with supervisors, and job security. 
For more on this, we go live to Tony Sapienza, Vice President of Greco Brothers, a garment manufacturer whose workers are represented by the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. Tony, how did child care, or lack of it, affect your company? I remember distinctly one particular woman who we'd spent a lot of time and money training, and she said to me, you know, if you had child care here, if there was a better child care situation, I'd stay. And that pushed me personally over the edge. She had the promise of being a long-term employee, and here we were losing her because of child care. But I saw that and thought we should do something. We don't want to get involved in people's families as a company, but we certainly want the family of the worker to not be a problem for us. Hey, Tone, goes without saying, but what about the dollars and cents? As a matter of fact, it's very easy to, to defend on a cost basis. Um, we average, uh, it costs us about $5,000 to train a new employee. So if we can just keep a few of those workers with us for the long haul, it's, the center could break even very, very quickly. So, Tony, where was the union while you were working all this out? The union's involvement was very important to this whole process because we didn't have enough money to start the center. Once we forged an alliance with the union, we were able to go out and raise money from some other companies in our neighborhood, from the city of Lawrence, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and finally from the two private foundations in the area that contributed to our startup. And we worked out a deal whereby our union workers contributed uh, one cent per hour of their newly won raise for one year to the startup of the child care center. And there's no question that individual workers who have children downstairs in the center are more productive, they're happier, and they come to work more frequently. There's no question that our other workers benefit, and it has to do with a sense of pride, and it, and it builds loyalty. Uh, quite frankly, this fits into our our corporate identity. It fits into how we want our workers to perceive us by providing a service to them as families as well as as workers. I'm back. The message from the child care center was not that my daughter had swallowed a spoon. She was learning how to follow a tune. Now a story about a child care initiative from the union side. Many members of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in New York's Chinatown are immigrants. A lot of immigrant women, when they come to the United States, say from someplace like mainland China, are shocked to find that there's no child care provided. Coming from a country where child care is available in, in many factories and, and neighborhoods, when they go out to work, they have to find something to do with their children. Sometimes they take the children to work with them. Uh, sometimes they have to uh, take work home to do, which is illegal. Sometimes they leave them at home. So that's how bad the situation was. And uh, we said, well, we should do something about this. The first thing we did, though, was to uh, circulate a petition. The petitions just basically called for uh, the union to help us with child care. We uh, took the petitions to the factories during lunch hour. And the response was overwhelmingly positive. In about 10 days, we got 3,000 signatures on these petitions. The union did research into the needs of child care of its members. And what they found out that there was five or 6,000 people needed child care. And almost all those people wanted a child care center. And in the course of doing this, uh, some of the employers in Chinatown, uh, the Chinese employers, um, thought it would be a good idea to have a fundraising banquet uh, for child care. And they put on a banquet uh, at one of the Chinese restaurants and raised a lot of money and uh, with the employers ready to pay some of the money for a Chinatown child care center this looked like it might be possible to set up something with the Agency for Child Development. The fees for this center are uh, based on a sliding scale. Most of the parents qualify for some sort of government subsidy so I think the average uh, tuition per week is uh, under ten dollars. Now hear this, he said. Right now we have about 75 children enrolled in the child care center, so we only take up one floor of the building. Uh, we have uh, four separate classrooms, and uh, the facilities are brand new. 
our survey showed that we need about five or 6,000 slots, and this center only has about 80 slots. So hopefully it's an idea which has gotten a start and which will catch on to more people. Keep the faith, Katie. One child care program, which started small, like yours, is now the biggest in the nation. Four public employee unions, along with the state of New York, contributed startup funds for this pilot program, which has grown to 31 daycare centers across the state. Labor and management develop this program together and meet monthly, expanding the system to serve more families. Looking back, what would you say made you initiate this program in the first place? Responding to our constituents who wanted child care and who wanted other benefits besides just salary. See, when it came to our committee, it was predominantly a male uh, union working in the prison, the prison guards or police officers. Uh, we were resistant. Uh, but then we looked at our membership. Our workforce has uh, their wife working, and there is the need for daycare out there. We don't treat it as a women's issue. It's definitely a family issue. It's an economic issue. Liz, what's in it for the employer? Any benefits on the other side? Um, as an employer, we find child care helps because we have people who can come to work without having to worry about what's going on with their child. Is their child at home after school by himself or on a holiday by him or herself? They won't have that problem anymore because they, in fact, are bringing their child to the daycare center on site every day. So we wind up with more employees who are happier, who are able to come to work with less problems, family problems outside of the workplace. So it's, a, it's an issue that is uh, important for both sides, and that's why we can address it in a, in a cooperative manner. This sounds almost too good. Is there a weak link? How's the quality of the daycare? We are committed to quality programs. Quality programs means you have to have good staff, staff that stay, um, all of which costs money. Our major emphasis is to keep daycare affordable. We have a sliding scale based on an employee's income. Janet, as a working mom, what's the benefit on the parent side? It's, it's such a relief to be able to go to work and know that she's going to be well cared for. The uh, continuity of care is very important to me. Having the experience of, of ha going through three or four babysitters in the course of a month is just very difficult for a parent to keep their mind on what they're doing at work. And uh, so definitely that's a, a positive aspect of working in a place where on-site daycare is provided. I have a child in a daycare center close to my work site. Uh, it allows me the opportunity to go and visit my daughter at my lunch hour at break or uh, see her early in the morning. So there is an advantage of having an on-site work location. I was laughing. So that's just his I think part of job security is, is family security, knowing that your, your offspring is uh, in a qualified program being taught by qualified teachers. We think we've been among the first to recognize that the American family has simply changed. It's no longer a beaver cleaver. Child care is, is good business. There's going to be a labor shortage, and we will need, as New York State, to be able to compete in order to do that. Uh, we're developing a number of family-friendly policies, as we call them, the Workside Child Care Center, maternity coverage, paternity coverage, adoptive parent leave. Um, a number of programs which allow our workers to have flexible hours, work part-time, share jobs, all of which we believe will make us more competitive and so provide better services to citizens. I think the, the number of, of children that need to be cared for is greater than I think we anticipated. And uh, the, the subsidy that we'll have to provide, I think, is greater than the startup costs that we, we're doing now. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we have to do. But you in New York have made a good start, and you're not alone. In Arizona, communication workers and their employer have been working on child care solutions for over a year and will explore additional options in preparing for their next meeting at the bargaining table. In the uh, summer of 1989, uh, we have contracts covering 500,000 uh, telecommunications employees. The issue of child care uh, will definitely be an issue at every single bargaining table. As a first step, these telephone operators want a 25% employer-paid subsidy for child care at a nearby center that is open 24 hours a day. This is something brand new, and we're very excited about it. The project is for a one-year trial period. 
with the view of expansion within the 14 state region if we can make it work. If I could send one message to the other locals nationally, get out there and talk to your management. If you get the initial no's, I had the initial no four years ago, and even though the company four years ago told us no and absolutely no, the idea was there, and it spread. Some unions have used their own resources to solve their child care problems. In Grand Junction, Colorado, many members of the United Food and Commercial Workers are grocery and retail clerks who work at night. They needed a daycare center with extended hours, so the union built and operates the first center in their community to be open from 6 in the morning to 11 at night, including Saturdays. And in San Jose, California, the Service Employees International Union made an innovative use of community resources. They saw a school with declining enrollment and used the empty classrooms for after-school care with the assistance of the YMCA and the school district. Are you ready for the big quiz, Don? What group of professionals are paid below the poverty line, averaging $9,000 a year, and seldom receive medical coverage or retirement benefits? Mm, leaf rakers? Dishwashers? Parking lot attendants? When I got out of college, I went to work in a daycare center, and I made um, $2.50 an hour, um, and I worked about 50 hours a week. Only that I only got paid for 40. So in the first year, I made $5,200. It's a job people do when they're young, or it's a job that people stay in and they live in poverty. And it shouldn't come as too great a surprise, Don, that the child care field has one of the highest turnover rates in the USA. I don't know, Laverne. Dishwashers turn over pretty fast, too, don't they? But the quality of dishwashing isn't affected, Don. The turnover rate is really really instrumental in quality. There's a lot of research that shows that um, children need consistency in their early life. You know, when they're in the two-year-old room, it's like, you know, who's gonna be my teacher next year? And, you know, not being sure because they see the staff come and go. And I also think that one of the ways that people really develop as childcare teachers is by working, you know, in the classroom. And if you have people come in and work for a couple years and then leave and they learn in those two years, then when they sort of reach what could be considered a master teacher level, they're gone. Well, Laverne, it sounds like there's no solution to this one. Oh, no. Unionized them, too? What we've seen in the unionized centers is that the turnover rate has gone down, and we see people sticking around, really, just because they've gotten large wage increases, and it means that they can um, afford to be in the field. And parents in both kinds of agencies have always been totally supportive of unionization. I think they're appalled when they realize what people make. They assume that people are paid as well as public school teachers. There's just like no reason to believe they're not. That's the really big quiz. You want to keep daycare affordable, and you want to pay daycare workers decent wages. How do you plan to do that? I think it's very clear when you look at the funding priorities in this country um, that um, children are not considered worth funding. You know, children's services get cut all the time. Parents are really being squeezed to pay for their child care costs. And so I think workers have to look to their employers to get them to pay for child care. But I also think that a national daycare policy would have to fund daycare. I guess she means government support. I wish men could start bearing a few of the babies. Well, there'd be a lot of changes if men could have children. Yeah, daycare centers would spring up overnight. More realistically, Unions across the country are making themselves heard by the government, in state legislatures and at the federal level. Here, union leaders meet with Congresswoman Pat Schroeder to shape strategy and bring the message from the grassroots. Desperate for this kind of legislation. So you have young people really on your side, which is exciting. I really, since my five, six years as a lobbyist, I've never seen an issue that our people are more excited about. I, to them, it's a, a very basic job security issue. Well. You've done your work, and you should be very proud because I think the prospects in the House are very good. Well, I know from our perspective in... Just as unions have gained parental leave for millions of workers through collective bargaining, now they are working for a law that would guarantee parental leave for millions more. What we need to do now is there are a lot of fence sitters. Now, what everybody can do is certainly find out where their local member voted. And actually, if you really look at what this is all about, I mean, the, the people we're talking about aren't even here, and that's the babies. Our children. 
In response to this crisis, child care advocate Helen Blank has seen the formation of a broad-based coalition to lobby in Congress for a national child care bill called the Act for Better Child Care. The bottom line when we talk about child care and family policy is what's happening to our children, our babies. I'm not sure that people ever stop and think about how vulnerable children are and the kind of attention and support and care that they need. One reason we have such a terrible infant care crisis is because some desperate parents are putting their babies into child care as early as one or two weeks because they know they don't go back to work. They're not only going to not get wages, they're going to lose their job. Um, and it's an outrage. Unions are taking some key first steps. At the bargaining table, they're arguing for the right to part-time jobs, to flex time, and parental leave policy. We can't depend on employers themselves, although unions can do more and more at the bargaining table, but we have three million employers and only 6,000 do something about childcare. There is a missing partner, and that's the federal government. The federal government really has refused to consider this issue seriously. Basically, since society has forced women to come out into the workforce, society really has to deal with child care. And um, I think that child care should become part of government policy just as education for grade schoolers and for high schoolers is part of uh, government policy. Children are our most important resource, and we should be trying to do everything we can to ensure that that resource has opportunities as well. When you look at what governments do, both city, uh, state, and federal, to promote economic development, why can't we promote child care as an economic development issue? We try to look at work and family issues the same way as you look at health and safety issues. If the boss has an unsafe machine, you don't negotiate and say, well, we'll take five cents less an hour if you fix that machine. You say, fix that damn machine. That's your obligation as an employer. The same thing applies to work and family issues. It's not a question of what it will cost to make the workplace a little more human. You say the workplace has got to be humanized.